Oh, God is good. Yeah, I know He is. Been good to me. He's been good to all of us here. And I thank God once again for His Word. In Judges chapters 6 and 7, we can read the whole story of Gideon. And I would encourage each and every one to go back and use that as a reason to dig into the Word this week and reread Judges chapters 6 and 7. And while we could spend a whole lot of time on all of the entire story of Gideon, today's message, which is titled Gideon, Absolute Abandonment, is intentionally focusing on what God saw in the heart of Gideon that would cause the angel of the Lord to hail him as Thou mighty man of valor. An angel of the Lord in chapter 6, verse 12, hailed him as mighty warrior. Abandonment means to give up to the control of influence of another person or agent. As in the case of Gideon, we will see the resolve that it took to abandon his questions and see what God had truly called him for. We'll see the very close similarities of our own lives and what Gideon dealt with as we open the book to Judges chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. If you've got your Bibles, open it up with me, your Bible apps. We're going to read several verses here, beginning with Judges chapter 6. Let's begin. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years and the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them the dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. And so it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them and they encamped against them. Verse 4 and destroyed the increase of the earth till thou come unto Gaza and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor ass. For they came up with their cattle and their tents and they came as grasshoppers for multitude for both they and their camels were without number. And they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel. Let's just stop there for a minute. It's interesting that the name of this prophet was not named. It never says who this prophet was. Why? Because it didn't matter. It wasn't about the man or the prophet. It was about the word of the Lord that was coming through that man that God had sent that God had sent because the children of Israel had cried. Are you following me? We just read 
in that verse that the Lord sent a prophet. The word that that prophet brought caused them to remember what God had done in the past. I don't know if you recall a couple weeks ago I brought a message called The Art of Forgetting. And I reminded everyone that if we really truly want to become great at forgetting our past or the things that try to hang us up, we need to become what? Experts in remembering. Remembering what God's promises are. Remembering the truth of His Word. Declaring, remembering what God means to each and every one of us here. And that's what this prophet did. He brought a word that caused them to remember what God had done in the past when He brought them out of Egypt. The prophet caused them to remember what a great deliverance they received when he pulled them out of a house of bondage. They were slaves. They needed deliverance. And God did it. He heard their cry and he answered. This prophet caused them to remember that God brought them into a land. He caused them to remember how good God was and he provided, he gave them peace. He gave them safety. God is the one that was to be given congratulations to. It was God that did the work. It was God Almighty that had mercy on the people. It was God Almighty that was giving favor to the ones who cried unto the Lord. But in verse 10, it says, the prophet is still speaking, but you have not obeyed my voice. The result, they had seven years of oppression under the hand of the Midianites. The Midianites, where it says they were coming up, and every time there was a harvest ready to reap, ready to bring forth, what would the Midianites do? What would the enemy do? Destroy it. And isn't that just like the enemy even today? Isn't that just like the way he tries to work? When we are at a place when we feel like, oh, we're really almost there. I mean, this is, this is it. We're almost there. And then all of a sudden, something happens and the enemy tries to take our harvest. Seven years, this is what the Midianites did. They did their best to try to destroy the harvest of God's people. But you know what? Even with their disobedience, and their shortcomings. God still hearkened unto them because it says they cried unto the Lord, verse 7, and the Lord sent them a prophet. God still sent His Word. God is so good. I mean it. I mean, there's no comparison. There's nothing at all that compares to the goodness and the mercy and the love that God has for each and every one of us. Amen? Go to that next screen, please. You know, the Midianites had made it impossible for the children of Israel to reap from their harvest, which, as we said, is so like what the enemy tries to do when we finally get a good boost of confidence the enemy will do or have something come in where why what happened you know what's the deal 
As soon as it looks like there could be a rich harvest of things, he'll come in and do everything to try. Pausing there, because that's all he can do. Try and destroy it. To cause you to question the work that you're doing and discourage you from rising up again. You see, we find Gideon in this chapter hiding himself away. Go to that uh, next. Yeah, I guess that's the one I want. Okay. Hiding in a, uh, a wine press, which is usually sunk into the ground and below ground level so that the Midianites couldn't see him. And we find him as he's threshing wheat. Verse 11 reads, And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak which is in Oprah. Not Ophrah, the one that you're thinking of, okay? Oprah, which means a fawn. It means new. An angel of the Lord comes to Gideon as he is threshing wheat. And it says that he was in Oprah that pertained unto Joash, that's his father, the Abizarite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. You see, when you're on the threshing floor, you beat the wheat so that the only thing that falls to the ground are the heavier particles, the grain. And then you throw it into the wind to separate the chaff from that heavier grain. It's a symbol of what God was doing to Gideon at that time. Gideon was threshing wheat. He was beating out the things that he knew, whether he knew it or not, had to come out of his life so that only the good, hard, heavy grains would come and fall to the ground. Amen? Go to that next screen as we keep on reading here. In verse 12, it says, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Now it's right here that we see how the Lord saw Gideon. He saw him as a mighty warrior, even if he didn't see himself that way. I'm quite certain that Gideon, when he sees an angel appear before him, he's bending over, threshing wheat, and all of a sudden, an angel of the Lord appears before him and says, you're a mighty man of valor. He probably said to himself, or maybe out loud, I think you got the wrong guy. Not me. You know, I'm just rushing wheat here. I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, uh, who are you? Come on. God's Word is real. The people in God's Word are real. If I would have thought something like that, I'm sure anybody else would have thought something like that. But you see, God was seeing the heart. He was seeing what was in the heart of Gideon. God does not call the qualified. He qualifies those he has called. You know, Paul even talks about it. I just want to flip to it. You don't you can stay in judges here, but in Romans fifteen 
Paul talks. And he says in verse 17 of chapter 15 in Romans, I have therefore whereof I may glory through Jesus Christ in those things which pertain to God. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. Verse 19, through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Ilcrium I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. He knew that it wasn't about him, but he knew that through Jesus Christ he was enabled, he was called to fully preach the gospel of Jesus Christ with signs and wonders that followed. Amen? It's becoming known now to Gideon that somehow God sees a virtue in his heart and begins to call him. Begins to call him for what he truly is seen as by God, a mighty man of valor. You see, you can tell what the enemy fears in your life by looking at what he attacks. I'm going to say that again. You can tell what the enemy fears in your life by looking at what he attacks. Let's go to that next screen here. Continue with me. Hold that thought. Into verse 13. And Gideon said to this angel of the Lord that came to him, said, O oh my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles, which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. The most common attack of the enemy is when he causes you to question. Are you hearing me? The most common attack is when he can get you to question. Well, why is all this befallen? Where be all his miracles? Hasn't the Lord said? I mean, I heard... Grandpa, I heard Dad say, The Lord, the Lord, great and mighty, He brought us out of Egypt, the Lord. If so, where is He? Where is He? See, the enemy's tactics aren't new. The Word says there's no new thing under the sun. And the only thing the devil can even do well at is lying and deceiving. The enemy will try to get you to question what you've been told or what you know is true. His questions are always going to lead you into deception and unbelief. Let's be real. What would you do if you were the enemy? <laughs> You're looking at me. I'm real question. If you were the enemy, 
what would you do? I want you to think about that, because that's a real question. What would you do if you were the enemy? I'll tell you what I'd do. I'd take as much Scripture, I'd take as much of the Word, I would understand as much of the Word of God as I could, and I would attack the people of God. That's what he did to Jesus when he was tempted in the wilderness. He came to him with what? The Word. And Jesus defeated him with what? The Word, because he is the Word. The enemy does not want you to become what God paid for you to become. The enemy attacks you when he sees something in you that is a threat to him. He wants you to remain moody. He wants you to remain anxious. He wants you to remain depressed, frustrated, disheartened, confused, offensive, never walking in the love of God. That's what he wants, what he tries to do. But the enemy knows you cannot stop God. The enemy knows you cannot defeat God. So he tries to stop people. But the good news, he cannot stop an overcomer. He cannot. He can try. The wiles of the enemy. But the Word of God is what gives us, right here, our weapon, our hope. Look at the example of Eve in Genesis chapter 3. The enemy attacked the knowledge. The enemy attacked the understanding of Eve when he questioned her and said, Yea, has God said that? You see, the enemy attacks what he fears. He was attacking the relationship that Adam and Eve held with God. He saw that close relationship. He was attacking it. He was attacking the communion that man was holding with God Almighty, the Creator. And he even brings in deception. And he said to Eve, you surely won't die. The enemy deceived Eve by attacking those things she held and then making them look questionable. She took of the fruit. It looks good, but the enemy comes in and says, if you eat some, you're going to be wise like God. Look at that. I mean, this is one of the juiciest apples. I don't know if it was an apple in the garden or what it was. It just says that you won't and should not eat of the fruit of it. I'm using an apple just as a prop. But you see, because of selfishness, Eve looked at it. Adam had to have been, probably was, right next to her. They had him. Isn't that? That looks pretty good. Yay, has God said? He's attacking your knowledge. He's attacking what you know. He's attacking what God gave you to understand. 
And then he goes further. You aren't going to die? I mean, look how good that is. Oh. And we know what happened. She ate of it. And all of a sudden, she looks down. Boom. I'm naked. <laughs> That's a real shocking moment, right? Why would she all of a sudden realize she was not clothed? Because the hand of the Lord, righteous and true is our God. He said, don't eat of it. The covering of the Lord lifted from Adam and Eve at that point. Sin entered into the world. Back to Gideon. Satan attacked the obedient heart that the Lord saw in him by making him question, where be all his miracles? Which led to questioning what our fathers told us. devil has no new tactics. That's exactly what happens even today. You see, Gideon was attacked in three different ways. Number one, his identity. He questioned, Gideon questioned how God could ever work with someone like him because it says in verse 15, I'm the least in my father's house. My father's not rich. We've got a poor family. We're not in that upper echelon or whatever that word is there, okay? Because I'm the least. So the enemy took what he could attack and he attacked his identity. And what it did is it caused Gideon to give in to that orphan mentality, that orphan spirit that says, I'm nothing. I don't have any value. God doesn't care about me. Look at my life. I screwed it up. I'm nothing. It's an orphan spirit mentality that he allowed to come in. The enemy attacked his identity. Number two, the enemy attacked his calling. The Lord had identified him as a mighty warrior, but he doubted that God would call someone like him who was so unqualified. He attacked his calling. And number three, he attacked Gideon by causing him to compare himself to others in the past. He said, our fathers told us that God brought us out of the land of Egypt, great signs and wonders. If he's so great, where be all his miracles? Comparison is the thief of your joy and identity. Because as it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12, he says, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. It just is not a good thing. Because it was true. It did happen that the fathers before Gideon did see the hand of the Lord move in their lives. They did. But you see, it is always up to the individual. The parents can't carry the children. Yes, they will cover them and pray for them and believe for them and decree and declare. And yes, I'm talking about this being a personal 
relationship with God Almighty, that's what you have to have. I don't care what your dad did. I don't care what your grandpa did. It doesn't matter what they did. What about you? And Gideon was attacked because he was willing to compare his life, his situation, with what he had heard others say. It's got to be in your heart. Am I making the point? This is a life of working out your own salvation. We read in verses 14 and 16 of chapter 6, And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? Verse 16, And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. You know, there's life. There is life, even in a word that we might not understand. Let me give you an example. When Jesus stood before the people and he said, eat my flesh, drink my blood, we see it recorded that almost everybody left him. He had a few of his disciples still remaining there. And Jesus said and asked, Will you go away also? Where are you at? Where's your heart? I said, eat my flesh. I said, drink my blood. I'm talking about having real communion, a real relationship that is tangible. And almost everybody left saying, that's wild. That is freaky sounding stuff. And he asked, and he comes to each one of us. Will you go also? And one of Peter's better replies at that time was, Lord, where are we going to go? Lord, what are we going to do? We believe that you have the words of eternal life. We believe, Lord, that you are the Christ. That was a good answer because Peter knew in his heart where he stood. And it wasn't based on those around him. It wasn't based on those that left. He was here. He was standing. He wasn't going to move. Amen? Come on, let me hear you. The rest of the story here. You know, the, en the enemy had attacked Gideon by making him question his identity and where the miracles had went to. The enemy attacked Gideon because he feared the heart that Gideon was carrying to accomplish the will of God. And so we read the rest of the story, paraphrased here. Gideon tears down the altars of Baal. He calls the people into an army. He gathers 32,000, which dwindles down, we know the story, to 10,000 after sending home those that were fearful and afraid, which goes down to an even more minute ratio of 300 against the Midianite army of 135,000. Ridiculous absolutely stupid odds, okay? That just doesn't work. Except in the eyes of God. Except when the Lord is fighting your battles. Except when God is directing the whole thing, amen? And so we read of how God encouraged Gideon in chapter 7, verses 9 through 11, 
in verses 13 through 14. Let me read them to you. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Arise, get thee down unto the host, for I have delivered it into thine hand. There again, God is confirming his promises. I told you I'd give the Midianites into your hand. Here it is again. I've given them, I'll show you. Go down into their camp here. Verse 10, But if thou fear to go down, go with your, my, thy servant down to the host, and thou shalt hear what they say, and afterwards shall thy hands be strengthened to go down unto the host. Then went he down with Pharaoh his servant on the out, unto the outside of the armed men that were in the camp in the host of Midian. Verse 13, and when Gideon was come, behold, there was a man that told a dream unto his fellow and said, Behold, I dreamed a dream. And lo, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the host of Midian. Stop a minute. You remember, it was Gideon at the beginning of chapter 6. He was threshing wheat to make grain. He was allowing himself to stop and receive what God had for him so that he could now at this point become a baked loaf of barley bread. Things had shifted. Are you with me? Things had changed. His mindset had changed. He understood what he was to do. And it says that that barley bread tumbled into the host of Midian, came unto a tent, smote it that fell, overturned it that the tent lay along. And his fellow servant, fellow answered and said, this is nothing else save the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel, for into his hand has God delivered Midian and all the host. This is the enemy speaking now. Do you see how good our God is when he is fighting your battle? Even the enemy is trembling. Even the enemy is saying, oh my gosh, that dream scares me because that is nothing but the sword of Gideon. It is God that is going to destroy what we wanted to destroy. God is good. So here's how. Gideon, now with 300 men, he gives them three things. He gives them a trumpet to make a sound, to let it be declared, to let it be decreed, to let a sound come out, the trumpet was what he gave them as one. Number two, he gave them an empty pitcher. An empty pitcher, P-I-T-C-H-E-R, okay? A pitcher, a glass pitcher, clay, whatever it was, that when you break that, it would reveal what was inside. Third thing he gave them was a torch. Third thing he gave them was a lamp inside of those pictures. So when the trumpet of the Lord sounded, when they in one accord broke that picture, it opened up and it revealed the light of God. And that's all it took. 300 of them doing as it says in verse 18, Gideon instructs them and says, When I blow with the trumpet, I and all that are with me, then blow ye the trumpets also on every side, all of the camp, and say, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Why did it say, and of Gideon? Because he understood who he was. The shift happened. In fact, read through and you'll even see his name was changed. Something happened where he could say, it is the hand 
of the Lord. It is the trumpet of the Lord. It is the sword of the Lord. And He will use me because I believe God. Amen? And in verse 21, it says, And they stood every man in his place round about the camp, and all the host ran and cried and fled. <laughs> and the 300 blew the trumpets, and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the host. And the host fled to Beshita in Zerath, and to the border of Abelmion, Abelmeloa, unto Tebath. Our God is a God of the impossible. Amen? And it may not even appear exactly what we have in our hands and what we have fully that God has given to each and every one of us. But if we will take time to get into the Word of God and discover who you are, who God calls you to be, thou mighty man of valor, the Lord is with you. If we would take that time to understand how much He truly loves you and sees you for the value that you are and realize how much He loved you that He even died for you, it will melt our hearts. It will melt the unbelief. It will melt the doubt and we will rise up in faith we will rise up in strength we will rise up knowing that my God my God is able to do all let's go to that last screen as we close him Second Peter Chapter 3, it's written, where is the promise of his coming? See, it wasn't just back in Gideon's day. It wasn't just something back kind of afflicting that group of people or in that age it wasn't even just in New Testament days early church there's always been the questions that the enemy will try to throw at your mind where's the promise where's where be all the miracles and that is where we must understand as we continue reading, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. The second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, there it is again, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. They're ignorant. They're ignorant because the word goes on to justify that our God is not slack. He sees every hair on your head. He knows every thought. 
He cares about you. He really does. Yeah. Verse 9 just confirms the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Brothers and sisters, Let the truth of God's Word rise up in you this morning. Let the remembrance of His promises come fresh to your mind of what God has done for us. Our minds, sorry, we cannot get a hold of of how great a love our God has for us and that He would give His only Son and allow Him to be whipped, beaten, mocked, hung on a cursed tree. Why? Because He loved us so much that He wanted us to live. We are blessed. We are blessed. We are blessed. We are blessed. And if there's anybody in here today that has struggled with who God has called you to be, I'm calling you to the altar calling because our God has an answer to your prayer if there's anybody that needs a touch from almighty God that yes Lord you are working you are moving on my behalf I believe your promises you said you would be with me I believe it I receive it. I thank you that you have called me for who I am. And I thank you that every one of you has a unique calling.